First off, another announcement. <coughs> Excuse me. Just got this, so um, I'm going to verify some of the things about it. But this is the report that I got. As of October 1st, Facebook will no longer allow live music uh -oh. right. or live streaming music. Yep. Now, what do you think that could possibly be aimed at? Hmm. Yeah. Yep. Uh, the people are upset that the church has found ways around all the restrictions, and so they're trying to clamp down as much as they can on these things. So, you know, <clears throat> wake up. Yep. So, um, don't know what we're going to be doing about all that, but we'll do something. Amen? Amen. <clears throat> now, um, we may have to go back to just broadcasting straight off of our website. If we do that, of course, you know, that's... A bit harder for everybody, but you may end up having to do that for those of you that are watching by internet, because uh, yeah, YouTube we can do it there. So, but we'll see, because I don't imagine YouTube will be far behind, <clears throat> because they're not going to leave the thing. So, anyway, we'll get it done. All right. Well, good morning. All right. So we're going to get right back in. That was some good worship. Amen. Amen. And so, um, you know, we don't just worship and stop worshiping. Our life. It's supposed to be worship, everything we're doing, everything we put our hands to. And uh, at times we use music, you know, to kind of back it up. But the rest of the time it should also be worship. So this morning, <clears throat> and we're going to tie this in with the first service, which I wasn't planning on it and I didn't see it. But uh, <clears throat> you can turn with me to Second Peter chapter 1. <clears throat> and we want to talk about the... Um, Literally, by these precious promises. That's what we're going to do. Um, you know what? What we're doing, do we have that video ready? Uh huh. Okay. We just. <laughs> okay. So. No, we're not going to win. If you do that, I'm going to take a picture of everybody doing this. So I'm going to take a picture. So. <laughs> Well, just wave at me when it, okay. Well, we'll do it at the end. We'll just do it at the end. Okay. Okay. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 1, talking about by these precious promises. Peter, it says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Notice the book of Second Peter was written to people who have obtained like precious faith. So there's one kind of faith, and it is a precious faith. Amen? And so if you have faith, this is the kind of faith you have. And if you have this kind of faith, then this book was written to you. Amen? So, verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied unto you, notice, through the knowledge of God. How do you get more grace and peace? By increasing the knowledge of God, right? The more knowledge of God you have the more grace and peace you can partake in. Do you get that? Okay. And of Jesus our Lord. Now watch verse 3. According as his divine power hath given us unto us all things. Say all things. All things. That pertain unto life and godliness. You hear that? So if you have <clears throat> obtained like precious faith, you have also been given all things that pertain to life and godliness. Do you see that? Yeah. Right? So whatever you need, you have. Amen. 
Do you get that? Christianity is not about getting. Christianity is about got. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. It's about recognizing what you have and believing it. Actually, um, I, was, <laughs> I was going to call this, because a lot of times we have to have names, because if you just put a date on it, people don't know what you're talking about, so I get it. So we give names to it, but I was going to call this, <clears throat> Is It Finished or Is God Just Slow? Then I thought, well, people surely wouldn't get that. So, because <laughs> that could go a whole bunch of different ways. <clears throat> but now notice, you have to recognize that you have been given everything that pertains to life and godliness. <clears throat> Nowhere in the Bible does it say God's going to heal you. It says, by his stripes, you were healed. Amen. Healing comes to your body when you recognize that and accept that and believe it for yourself. Amen. All right? That's one way you can get it. <clears throat> it's just like salvation. See, your salvation was paid for 2,000 years ago. You decide when you're going to receive it. And you receive that the minute you believe that he died for you and was raised from the dead for you and you make him Lord of your life. Amen? So, <clears throat> now, he says, <clears throat> excuse me, according as his divine power has given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. Now notice, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. So how do these things come to you? Through the knowledge of him. That's twice. Once in verse 2, and then again here in verse 3, it keeps emphasizing the knowledge of God, having a knowledge of God. Then he says in verse 4, watch this. Where, now, well, let me go back to, into verse 3. Who has called us to glory and virtue. He didn't just call us to glory. He's calling us to virtue. See, we have to recognize that there has been a steady decay, an erosion of any real change in Christians' lives in the minds of people talking about Christianity. Yeah. In other words, we talk about it simply as, honestly, it's become more and more where it's just get your ticket you know, punched, and when you get out of here, you go to heaven. Or you go the other way where it's all about what you can amass here. And we have to realize it's not about the things. Like I said, it's not a, Christianity isn't about getting. It's about God. And it's about understanding what you have. <clears throat> and then you start to develop those things that are in you, as we would say, in seed form. But we are called to virtue, which means that we are called to actually walking in righteousness, to walking in honesty, to walking in integrity, to walking in faith. That's what Christianity is. It changes a person so that you have a person <clears throat> like Peter who, you know, <laughs> was back and forth, but then he gets so steadfast that he's willing to die a martyr's death just for his faith in Christ. That's a change in the basic nature and character of a person. That it's not, he wasn't just following a philosophy. Men don't die just for a philosophy or an idea that could be wrong. All of these followers of Jesus died pretty much all violent deaths. And you don't do that just because you're trying to start a new system of religion. In the, in the sense that they had to believe that Jesus was raised from the dead. Amen? Amen. That's one of the best proofs or evidences that Jesus' resurrection was real. It's because everybody that followed him were willing to die for that teaching that he was raised from the dead. And men generally don't die for a lie that they know is a lie. So, <clears throat> now, he says, verse 4, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Say that with me. Exceeding great and precious promises. There you go. Because I want you thinking that we have exceeding great and precious promises. Amen? Amen? Not just promises. Exceeding great and precious. Now, he says that by these, these what? These exceeding great and precious promises. By these promises. Here's what I want you to get. 
in my life, when I, I've been studying the Bible most of my life, uh, to greater or lesser degree, early on much more, and then uh, teenage years and that kind of stuff, not quite as much, and then in teenage years to now, consistently, you know, in depth. I don't make the, the Bible this um, book of spells, you know, or incantations, or, you know, it's not a book, it's not a magic book. The secret is in believing what it says and then living that way. <clears throat> now, this is the essence <clears throat> of Christianity, is that you believe it and you live accordingly. And whatever he tells you to do, you can do, because if he commands it, he has to empower you to be able to do it. Right. Especially if it's something you couldn't do on your own. <clears throat> he cannot require you to do something you cannot do without also including the power to do it. So if he tells you to do something you can't do, then he has to give you the power to do it or he can't hold you responsible for not doing it. Amen? Yes. So when he says, heal the sick, then you say, well, that's impossible. I can't do that. Uh, not in yourself. Because without him, you can do nothing. But with him, all things are possible. Which is also to him that believes all things are possible. Right? So if you believe him, and you say, okay, you said heal the sick, I'm going to go heal the sick. Then you have to know that when you get to the sick, maybe not before, but when you get to the sick, you're going to have whatever they need. That's, right. That's the essence of what we teach concerning divine healing. <clears throat> and that he said do it, so our job is to do it, right? right. Now, <clears throat> also, it shouldn't be from a standpoint of um, ritual, okay, Get up in the morning, okay, I'm going to uh, get dressed, go out, and I'm going to go find, you know, 10 people to, to, to heal. Okay, well, you can do that. But at the same time, don't get 10 people healed and then ignore people that obviously need it later. Well, I've already got my 10. You know, sorry, I'll try to catch you earlier in the day tomorrow. Yeah, no, that's not the way it works. This is life. <clears throat> so that whatever you need is there when you need it. Now, you need it when they need it. So if they come to you and they need something, you have been given all things that pertain to life and godliness. Amen? Amen. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Notice, he says here, that by these, these what? These precious promises, exceeding great and precious promises, you might be partakers of the divine nature. So here he tells us that now, I want you to get this. Let's focus on this, all right? This is really more teaching than preaching, per se. <clears throat> he says that by these exceeding great and precious promises, we become partakers of his divine nature. So that means that we have promises. In other words, we don't just have his divine nature, but it is by these promises, words written in a book, that we can take those promises, because, see, it's a promise until it's yours. In other words, it's a promise while it's in the book. But when you take it out of the book, put it in your life, and do it, now that promise becomes reality. See, a promise is always future. A promise is never current. That, does that make sense? Because yeah. if it was current, then it wouldn't be a promise anymore. It'd be what you have. And so the idea is that he gave us this book that has all these exceeding great and precious promises, amazing promises. I mean, just it's just loaded with promises. Basically, the whole book is promises that tells us, if you do this, this is the effect it will have in your life. So we can take these promises and put them into our life. And when you put them into your life, you actually, you're, and I don't like to use the word activate in that sense, but it's as if you're activating that essence. Um, we would say like in, in the DNA, it's activating that gene. See, when you were born again, you were recreated perfect and complete in him. So you have his DNA, right? His spiritual DNA, you have that in you. And whenever you do something 
In other words, whenever you read, uh, believers shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Now, there's a lot more promises, please. I'm just using these because it has to do with an action. And so when he says, believers lay hands on the sick and they shall recover, then the moment you start to lay hands on the sick, you have activated that gene in you, and now it's working. Do, do you get that? So how do you get these promises to work? Well, just like a promise would be a seed, you have to plant it, but then you have to water it, and you have to nourish it, and all that kind of stuff. And the way you do that simply is by finding it in the Word and then acting upon it as though it's true. Now, in the beginning, it may be a little slow in coming because you're not, you know, when you start gardening, you may not be the best gardener, right? And you may have other seed coming in. But whenever you focus and you decide to have that seed, then you start eliminating the other seed. Now, the number one, uh, we know that the Bible is the Word of God. We know that the Word of God is a seed, and it's incorruptible seed, and it's how we're born again. But we have to remember the Bible is the Word of God. And the word of God is the seed. And the sower goes out to sow the seed. And he, the seed he sowed was the word of God. Right? So this word is these promises are the seed. They're, they're seed and they're promises as long as they're in the book. But once you take them out of the book and you put the seed into the soil of your heart, of your life, now that thing starts to grow. You can read, by his stripes you were healed, the rest of your life and die sick. But at some point, you're going to have to say, you know what? I believe that. Now, here's the beauty of it. I want to read this to you. I was going to read it a little bit later on. I'll read it now. And then we'll come back to the scriptures here. Okay. Here's what I want you to remember. Right? You might want to write these two things down. Two or three things. <laughs> so, number one, God... Now, listen, I'm, I'm going to catch flack on this <laughs> from, from religious people yeah. that don't like this, but the fact is it's true. God cannot say no to what he's already said yes to. Right. That's right. Because he cannot change the thing that comes out of his mouth. Amen. Amen? So if God cannot say no to what he's already said yes to, then there is no, there, there's no no from God concerning the promises of God. Do you get that? Now watch. God can't say no to a promise that you decide to believe and act upon. That's what you need to write out. God cannot say no to a promise that you decide to believe and act upon. Now, let me give you an example. Because see, people are going to say, well, you're just making God into this you know, machine, this thing, and you're taking away his sovereignty, and God can do whatever he wants to do. No, no, no. I'm saying you take his promise, you believe it, you act upon it, and by doing that, you're allowing him to do what he wants to do. Amen? Because the promise is not against God. God is, okay, the promises that God gives us are not somehow against him. They are his will. Because if he doesn't, if he's not speaking his will, he's lying. And God can't lie. So if God gives us a promise, then that promise is what he wants to see in our lives, us living out. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay, just kind of laying, you know, foundation here. Now, to give you the example, can God turn away someone who meets the conditions for salvation? No, that's why you're so bold if you're witnessing to someone to tell them, God, you can get saved right now. I mean, right now, you can get saved because God has said. Isn't that right? Amen. You don't hesitate. Well, you know, let's pray and see if God wants to save you. You know, I mean, because he, you know, he may not. I mean, you know, we don't know where he is today. You know, we don't know how he feels towards you. I mean, I, I'm saved, and I know I'm saved. And, you know, and God loves everybody, but, you know, I'm his favorite. You know? Uh, so I'm not sure how he feels about you. I know he loves you, but that doesn't mean he wants to spend eternity with you. You know, so we, we're not sure. You see, we wouldn't even think that way. We tell a person, man, if you'll make Jesus Lord, you confess him as Lord, guess what? You get born again. You turn, repent from your sin. You come to him. You make him the Lord of your life. You will be born again. Isn't that right? 
And we don't hesitate with that. I mean, and we don't, we don't move off of that. Somebody comes up, well, but what about if it's not, what, what about this? What, but you're telling me if Hitler, what, yeah, if Hitler, if Hitler fulfilled the conditions for salvation, he could get saved. Isn't that right? Yes. Now, I don't want to live next door to him, but still, you know, <laughs> not even in heaven, okay? <laughs> so, now, but all I'm trying to get across is that we know this in salvation, but for some reason, everything else, we try to push it off as if, well, let's see if it's God's will. Well, let's see if it's God's will to do this. Let's see if this is God's will. Well, let's pray and see if this happens. But yet, salvation, the biggest thing, we are so sure on. Well, if he's good and you know, honest with the biggest thing, how much more should the other things that by definition, would be smaller things, how much more would they be guaranteed? Amen? I mean, if you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that if you asked me, I'd give you $100, how much faith would it take for you to ask me for $5? Not much, right? I did not bring any cash with me today. <laughs> Just so you know. <laughs> okay. <laughs> no. Now, all right, let's go back to the scripture. Make sure, okay. <laughs> okay, now, notice, he said, <clears throat> whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these precious promises, you might be partakers of the divine nature. So you have to take these promises and put them in your life, and they will become part, now, now notice this, these promises are all the DNA of God, and each one of these have to do with his divine nature. Every promise is a part of God's divine nature. Why? Because by these promises, we become partakers of the divine nature. Amen? Do you get that? Do you realize what you have when you have a Bible? I mean, man, every promise of God is in here. Everything he's ever promised man is in here. Every aspect of himself. See, this is why he gave us so many names like Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Sidkenu, all of these names. What are those names? Those are names that give us an idea of his nature and character. And he said, I want you to know me as Jehovah Rapha. I want you to know me as Jehovah Jireh, the Lord your provider. I want you to know me as these names. Why? Because these names show his character. Do you realize all of these names have to do with some type of action? Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals, the God who does something. Not the God who sits back and watches your life, you know, go down the tubes. Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. That's an act. Do you see it? His name always, his names represent his nature, and his nature always incorporated action toward us. Amen? Do you get that? So we take these promises, and they become the DNA of God's nature, and we say, oh, this is what God's like. <clears throat> what does that mean? Well, by his stripes you were healed. Oh, so God's a healer. Well, yeah, he said that, Jehovah Rapha. See, we start to look at him and go, wow, look at this. This is a promise. So this is a promise that I can activate. Why? Well, let's look at the scripture. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, well, I'll get there. It's taken a little bit. <clears throat> but he said that by these, you, be, you might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Now he's showing you having escaped the corruption in the world, right? That is here through lust. So he said these promises help you escape that corruption. Now corruption just that doesn't just mean like we would say, well, the government is corrupt. Well, that would be one aspect. But corruption also has to do with decay. It has to do with going down. It has to do with uh, degeneration, right? <clears throat> now, it says, watch this, and besides this, giving all diligence. So what does that mean? That means this is something we should be paying attention to, right? This is not just anything. He says giving all diligence. In other words, we ought to be diligent at focusing on these things to make them come to pass. Because he says, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. Well, see, we talk about, well, if we just have faith. Well, yeah, if you just have faith, it'll work for you. But he didn't say stop there. He said, add to your faith virtue. Now, the thing you're going to see here <clears throat> is that all these things you already have 
Why? Because he's already given to it right here in the same passage. He's already given us everything that pertains to life and godliness. So we already have virtue. Do you get why? Because that pertains to life and godliness. So we already have it. You say, well, then why does he say add to it? He's talking about mixing it together and having faith in God for virtue so that you can live virtuous in this life. You see? So the seed is already there. But how I many of you know you can starve with a seed? Right? The only way you eat is if the seed produces. Amen? So he says, and to virtue, now you, at the end of virtue, you tack on what? Knowledge. It's amazing to me how much people put down knowledge, especially biblical knowledge. They will tell you, okay, when you go to school, learn all you can, get all you can, because the more knowledge you get, the better off you're going to be, and they push that. Then they come to church, and they go, oh, knowledge puffs up. <laughs> knowledge puffs up. No. But, they're only, but they only refer to knowledge of the Bible. And it's amazing because all through the Bible, there is reference to knowledge in a good way. Now, you don't want knowledge without love because knowledge without love will puff up, right? And, you know, many times that comes in the form of theological degrees and all that kind of stuff. But the idea is that if you love God and you love people, then you should add knowledge, the knowledge of God, knowledge about God. <clears throat> you should add that to your virtue and to your faith. Do you notice it says have faith? Why? Because that represents total dependence on God. And then it says to that add virtue, which means literally living right, doing, doing vir living virtuously, all right? Then it says to that add knowledge. Well, if you, what, if you, what if he said to your faith add knowledge and to knowledge add virtue? Well, you, so you see the importance, faith, total reliance on God, then virtue, Living right, having standards, having dignity, having integrity, having faithfulness. You see what I'm saying? That's virtue, right? Now, once you have that, oh, now start adding knowledge. Why? Because if you add knowledge to that, now it'll, it'll add to the virtue and the knowledge won't corrupt you. Do you see it? Okay. Now, notice he says, and to knowledge, temperance. Temperance, self-control. See, why? Because if you don't add self-control, yeah, you will get puffed up. But if you add self-control, now you can live according to the knowledge, according to the virtue. Now, you, so you can see how this thing, it's like laying a foundation of bricks and then laying the next layer of bricks on top and on top, and you're building this strong structure that is righteous before God. Amen, do you understand? It's not your own righteousness but you're building a right way of living that will carry on. Now, see, here's something. I was talking with, with George this week, and it's one of the things that I always go back to <clears throat> is that, and especially looking at, at church life, uh, you know, other churches and just Christianity, <clears throat> because, I, as a matter of fact, just a minute ago, I had some pictures laid out, and when I was in Virginia... Uh, early on, I'm talking about 2000, 2001, somewhere through there, uh, I was with uh, Ruth Ward Heflin. I don't know if you all remember Ruth Ward Heflin or not. Um, tremendous woman of God. And she had gotten sick at one point, so they asked me to come up and, and pray for her. They flew me there specifically to pray for her. And then while I was there, they asked me to preach. And so I had gone to her house, prayed for her. Uh, she was recovering. Everything was good. She got, she got well, basically. And then, but, and it was about, uh, I don't know, six, eight months later, uh, another thing hit her very hard, and she passed away. But the strange thing was, she had actually talked about that. But anyway, that's, I'm sorry. Anyway, um, when I went there, I prayed for her, and then I went to the church there, the tabernacle, camp, campground. And while we were sitting there, they had me sitting on the platform with about 20 other ministers that are there, and it was a good revival meeting. I mean, it was strong. And it was the, during the heyday of the gold dust. And so I'm sitting on the platform with these men of God, and I see this stuff, and this guy sitting, an elderly man sitting next to me, kind of elbowing, and, and then I'm like, yeah, what is that? You know, because I couldn't really see it. I could see something, and he said, that's gold dust. And I'm like, really? 
He said, yeah, and it was literally like if I was sitting against this wall, it would probably be a little bit further out here. It was the strangest thing. You know how if you look through a window, you see the wall and then you have a window and you can see outside. And if it's raining, you can see it, the rain through the window, right? But you can't see it where the wall is, but you see it when it passes the window. It was just like that. It was like a window that it appeared, went down about two foot, three foot, and then disappeared. It was like I was looking through a window, but there was no wall there. Wow. And I could see this gold dust falling. I didn't know what it was at the time because I'd, I'd never seen it like that. And so he said, yeah. He said, come on. And so he got me up. And we walked over there, put our hand in. It was all over our hands. And then went back and sat down. And we were like this. And in, in a few seconds, it was gone. I was freaking out. Right? <laughs> I just, I'm just going to tell you. I hadn't seen anything like that. So I'm like, okay, this is, this is weird. Okay. <laughs> and so, but then it started getting very strong. And people started talking about it more and more. And they started talking about the gold dust. They started talking about oil coming off people's hands. Some people off their head, different things. Now listen, listen carefully. After that started happening, and they started promoting that, it was right after that that Ruth Ward Heflin died. To my knowledge, now maybe I'm wrong, but everybody that I have researched that was big in the gold dust, they're dead now. And every one of them died of some form of cancer. Every one of them. Now, I'm not sure about the oil thing, I would assume that would be very similar. Now, again, I'm not making a, you know, some kind of statement on it. I'm just saying, to me, that seems something to be aware of and maybe to be wary of. Why? Because too often it got weird. And people started making that the thing as opposed to focusing on God, which that's what we do a lot of times. We get more, uh, we put more emphasis on the gift than we do the giver. Right? And so that was just about the way. But anyway, um, <clears throat> while we were there, one of, the, one of the things that I've noticed in, since that time is that there has been a steady erosion away from virtue, especially among charismatics. Um, it, it, it's, you know, most teaching... Most preaching has become motivational as opposed to biblical. Or they'll take biblical things and turn it into that. And so we, we need to be aware of this. Now, the reason I brought up the gold dust stuff is because of this. All the stuff that is not Bible, the stuff that, that a lot of people make a big deal about now, wouldn't work a hundred years ago. Wouldn't, wouldn't, it wouldn't, back then people had certain standards of Christianity mm -hmm. and they wouldn't get drawn off into that stuff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, and many of them were focused on living good lives, which you can live a moral life to a large degree, but if you have the Spirit of God, then how much more should the Spirit of God turbocharge your moral life? Amen? I mean, if you have the Holy Spirit, you should have a holy life. Right. Amen? Amen? And I remember when I was in the Baptist church, man, we were always witnessing. And if we ever prayed for anything, pretty much it was the power to be a good witness and the power to be able to lead people to Christ and the power for the power of the Spirit to draw people to Christ through our witnessing. Then a lot of us got baptized in the Holy Spirit and found power, and then all of a sudden we ceased witnessing. And now it just became a good church service. And the emphasis was on this thing or that thing. And the problem is that Christianity in and of itself has to transform a person's heart yes. so that they live godly lives, yes. not just lives with power. Now, I'll admit, I'll be the first one to admit, whenever my daughter died, first when she got, was born with a hemangioma tumor, and I started investigating and looking for healing, I wasn't trying to be a better person. 
I was looking for power. I was trying to find out how to get my daughter healed. And I, I didn't find the truth while she was alive. And then after she died, we started coming into the truth. And, but at, even at that point, I wasn't looking at trying to be a better person. Maybe I should have. Maybe there were you know, aspects of my, not maybe, absolutely. Okay, not maybe. <laughs> but, but there should have been uh, more of, I should have heard more of that. What really helped me the most during that time was I got a hold of some books of sermons of Charles Finney. Now, that just totally revolutionized my life because I, he really held me to Scripture to say, God said this. He said, be ye perfect as I am perfect. Well, there is no higher standard. There can be no higher standard than being as perfect as God. And now, we all fall short or have fallen short, put it that way. But that started causing me to focus on, okay, my life needs to be better, right? Because at any given moment, how much do I look like God, right? And so I had to start analyzing. And again, you know, failed miserably many times in trying to live there. But I had to learn the grace of God because it's by the grace of God is the only way you can live there. That's the only way. Grace, as I said before, doesn't give you the right to mess up and get away with it. Grace gives you the power to live above that and to live the standard of God, right? Now, back in the scripture. The main reason I said that was because I want you to realize Christianity was never meant to be a religion, as we said. And if you go back to the garden, it's amazing. You see two gardens, one in Genesis and one in Revelation. And if you see in both of them, what you see is God walking with man in the garden, in Genesis and in Revelation. God just wanted a relationship. He wanted to walk with man. That's why in the Garden of Eden, you don't see an altar. You don't see any of that stuff until after man's fall, which means that all of that was for man. All the altar, the sacrifices, it wasn't for God. It was for man. Do you get that? Because man's sin had separated him, so blood had to be shed, and the blood of animals would never equal for the life of a man. Why? Because man was God's highest achievement. So they had to keep offering the animals until Jesus came so that he could die in our place. Amen? I, I know this is simple, simple gospel. But we have to realize is that God wanted to walk with man. He didn't want man to do rituals. He didn't want man to do certain rituals that would put him in good favor with God. He just wanted to walk with man. And, and unfortunately now, 90% of what we call, if not more, of what we call Christianity, God has nothing to do with. Yeah. Right. That is, you know, and, and everything else, it's all the trappings. Right. You know, it's like a, how can I say it? It's almost like a um, prearranged marriage. Mm. You know, a prearranged marriage, I mean, for women, it's the wedding. It's a big deal, right? The dress and the bridesmaids and the flowers and the and all the stuff, and oh yeah, there's a groom. <laughs> you know, <laughs> and the groom's just kind of like, just tell me where to be and when to show up. I'll be there, you know. But everything else, it's all for the women. It's not for the men, right? The men, come on, we we really don't care, all right? And and we only put up with that because we are totally enamored with the person we're married. I mean, that's the only reason we do it, okay? Otherwise, just, nope, not going to do that. Um, which is why they started the tradition of the bride's fathers paying for the wedding. Because they're like, the groom is like, the groom, I ain't, I ain't paying for that. <laughs> I love her, but I'm not sure how much. I, and I'm, even, I'm not even sure how long this is going to last. So I'm not putting a lot of money out, you know. I mean, come on, let's, you know. Yeah. So... You know, the, the father says, I'll pay you to take her. <laughs> right? That's what happens. Okay. But it's kind of like that prearranged marriage. <laughs> it's, it's, it's to hide behind something up here. <laughs> but it's like that prearranged marriage where it's all this stuff, but it's the marriage that counts, not the ceremony. Now, I'm not saying the ceremony isn't important that you should do it before God. Yes, it is. Okay, but I'm saying 
the, the marriage, the, the wedding is an event. The marriage is a lifestyle. Amen? It's a life. And so too often, Christianity is like every Sunday is the wedding. But how's the marriage during the week? That makes sense? Yeah. So at some point, we have to walk in the marriage and walk with God and become one as opposed to just attending the ceremony. Because God wasn't about the ceremony in the garden. There's no ceremony in the garden. I mean, it's amazing. Not until man fell. And so I always say, no matter what, when I look at Christianity, that's one of those things, guideposts, that I always, it's like I was telling George that I said, it's almost like I'm on this short leash tied to this guidepost that no matter what I look at, I always go back to in the garden, God just wanted man. And so when I see the other stuff, I realize, no, that's just what men do, people, it's what people do to keep people coming. That's right. Because it's become a business. Yes. And because you have to pay rent yes. and you have to pay electricity. And you have to, so you got to put on a show. So you got to have an event. So you got to have a wedding every Sunday. Right? Yes. No matter how the marriage goes during the week, yes. you got to keep them coming back. And, and honestly, I can tell you, we, we, we haven't done that here. And I'm, I'm glad for that. that. But I'm always on guard against that. Yeah. I'm always watching for that and thinking, okay, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? Right. Does it? Does it represent Christ? Does it bring us closer to Christ? Does it help us in our walk with Christ? Or is it just marketing? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because if it's just marketing, then there's no life in it. And so I'm always looking at that and going back and saying, okay, in the garden, God wants our lives. He wants us. He wants to walk with us. He wants to communicate with us. And honestly, that can, it's, it's going to look, I mean, according to the Bible. But have you ever noticed there's no description of Jesus in the, in the Bible? You ever notice that? It doesn't talk about his appearance. When it does, it says there's nothing about him that we would even really think about. Think about that. You know, we, we picture him, we talk about him, and we picture him like he's the most beautiful, you know, person to ever walk the earth. But the Bible doesn't say anything like that. So it really doesn't go about the outward appearance at all. Right. And it says only man looked at that. And I think it's a, it, there's a reason why God didn't put that in there. And you can, you can understand some things, you know, by Bible scriptures. It says that they tore his beard out, so we know he had a beard, Right. And so there's different things that you can figure out with it, but there's no description. They didn't talk about the color of his eyes, you know, the length of his hair. They, they didn't talk about his complexion. They did David. Right. They talked about David's looks. Isn't that right? They talked about Saul's looks. Didn't talk about Jesus. Why? Because it'd be too easy to turn that into a God, uh, an idol, uh, an, an image. Right. Right. And then you worship the image more than you do the person that the image is of. And so it always, I always go back to that of trying to make sure that what we're doing relates to everyday life. And, you know, different lifestyles, again, it's always going to look Bible. But there's enough parameter there that if you take whatever a person, whatever, whoever they are in their daily life, uh, you can see Christianity in that, and it can take that form. You know, if you're a biker... You can be a biker and be a Christian. Amen? Yeah. You can still ride bikes and be a Christian. Yeah. Now, you might not be able to do what biker gangs do, <laughs> but you can be a biker, right? You can be, you know, we have, we, we have biker churches. Matter of fact, we have a, a lot of biker churches that have this message now that they have brought in and they teach this message in their biker church. But they still ride motorcycles and they still go places and you know, I had, a, I had a motorcycle up until I gave it to my son a couple of years ago. And so, you know, I've always, I've always been around bikes and I like them. But then we also have cowboy churches. Well, if you go to a biker church, it's going to look drastically different than if you go to a cowboy church. <laughs> Why? Because that's the culture of the people. And so, now understand, Christianity can, can, it can exist in any culture. 
But any culture it goes into, it's going to sanctify the culture and make it holy. Yeah. So if that culture isn't holy, it is not Christian. Yeah. Right. Amen? So you've got biker churches. You've got cowboy churches. You've got different kinds of churches based on what people can associate around. You know, this is, this is the culture that we live in. This is our, we'd say, our hobby or our lifestyle. And as long as that lifestyle does not go against the Bible, it's okay. Amen? Amen? Now, if it goes against the Bible, then it has to change or just quit calling it Christian. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And so a lot of people want to do whatever they want to do and then still call it Christian. Yeah. But it ha there are certain parameters that it has to meet to be called Christian. Amen? Amen. So, hope that helped a little bit, but I need to move on here. So, <clears throat> notice here. In verse 6, and to knowledge, temperance, and to temperance, patience, and to patience, godliness, and to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, charity. Notice all these things that he keeps saying, just add on, add on, add on. He doesn't say do it all at the same time. Why? Because you may have to focus on one thing at a time and focus on that thing. Why? But here's the thing. You go back to the garden. You don't see miraculous power because you didn't need it. Why? Because everything was good. Right. Right? You don't need miraculous power if everything's good. Now, he did give him dominion, and he named the animals when he called them. God caused the animals to come, but he had dominion over these things, so he could tell this one do that and do this, and, and they would do it. So there is power there, but not power like we see to heal the sick and raise the dead and cast out devils because there were no devils, right? There were no dead to be raised, there was no sick to be healed because it was all good. Right. Amen? So, if our lives are right with God, then we ought to be able to put our life as it is back in the garden in Genesis and say, you know what? It's good. It's good. I don't need to be healed. Why? Because it's good. Isn't that right? I don't need to be raised from the dead. Right? I don't need to cast out a devil. Why? Because my life is good in him because I'm walking with him day by day. I have virtue. I have faith. I have knowledge. I have temperance. I have godliness. I'm, I'm walk, and I'm developing. Now, it's going to get better. I'm not saying we've arrived. You're developing these things. But if you don't focus on that, it, see, the problem is in Christianity because we come to church and for a short period of time and then we're gone for the rest of the week, and we're not really renewing our minds because you can't renew a mind, you know, in an hour or two on Sunday. It's every day, right? And so you have to have that in you. And, but that would be your life walking with God in the garden to where you say, you know what? My life is good. I'm doing this. I'm growing. Tomorrow, guess what? I'm not what I was yesterday, but tomorrow, and tomorrow I'll be better than I am today. Why? Because the path of the righteous grows brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. So I'm continuing. Now, is it good? Yes. Is it going to be good? Yep, it's going to be gooder. Okay? Okay? Why? Because I'm, I'm, I'm growing and developing these things. But too, too many times we focus on developing power and not virtue. And that's why, see, I've always looked at church like different denominations and things, almost like school. And each church, can, or each denomination or whatever, um, is almost like a different grade level. You know what I mean? Because when I started, I was in a particular church, but then I kind of outgrew that church or graduated from that church and got with another group, and that was the next grade. And I kind of grew from there and kind of went to the next grade. And the key is not to get stuck in one grade but to grow and keep growing and keep graduating yeah. walking with God. Mm -hmm. But too often we want to walk with people more than God, so we stay. You know, I, well, I, don't want, I, I don't want to get promoted. You know, I don't want to graduate and go to sixth grade because all my friends are in fifth grade, and, and they're not passing, so I don't want to pass. You know, I want to stay with them. No, that doesn't make sense. Amen? But too often we want to be with people more than we want to be with God, so we don't let him change us and move us from grade to grade, Amen. glory to glory. Yeah. Amen? Faith to faith, okay? Wow. But if we just walk with God, mm -hmm. then we walk through this life, 
Yeah, if there needs to be power, because guess what? My life is good. Some people's lives aren't. And in my world, which means anybody I make contact with, if their world isn't good, if their life isn't good, now they're in my world. And if they're in my world, now, so I am to have dominion. Isn't that right? And if I have dominion, then I can exert that dominion in their life because their life is in my world because I met them and now I can set them free. So they need power. I don't need power. They need it. So I have it because they need it. I don't have it because I need it. Now, if I need it, it's there also. But the job is to get to a place where you don't need it. Amen? You live out of the blessing, not out of the miraculous. Miracles are always to fix a problem. Blessings just keep piling up. Why? Because things are good. Does this make sense? Yes. But we have to make sure that just because we moved from the church that taught good living, that we didn't leave the good living behind when we moved to the church that taught power. And now we talk about his power and not about how people live. Does this make sense? Yes. So we have to have all of this together. That's why he said, to your faith, add virtue. Let that virtue come out. To virtue, add knowledge. See, growth. Grade level by grade level. And if we can do that, now we start living this life. And when you live the life, it's amazing how peaceful everything gets. Because you have to remember, we're in the middle. I mean, this world is messed up. The whole world lies in darkness, John said. Yes. It lies in darkness. It's dark out there. And here we are with our lights. But how bright is our lights? Right? Now, it doesn't take a whole lot of brightness to light up darkness, right? All you, you got to do is let your light shine. And, but if you can live your life as a light in this world, but, but you think about it, the whole world lies in darkness. So it's not like we're lighting the world. We're just letting our light shine so that anybody that gets near us, that they see that light. So the key is just to live the life that lets the light go. But if your light is dark, Jesus said, if your eye is single, then your light is great. But if it's not, then you're gonna, it's going to be great darkness. Too many Christians operate in power, but are operating also in great darkness because they don't have the goodness of God. They don't have the peace of God. See, like I said, there's, there's, this world is messed up. There's... Chaos, there's confusion, there's problems, there's strife, all this stuff. And it, the Bible is very clear, where there, wherever there's strife, there's every evil work, right. right? And so the enemy, his job is to stir up strife and get all this stuff going on. So we're in the middle of this war, and the key is to keep peace. See, peace is not peace unless there's not peace out there. Does that make sense? If everything was peace, how would you know peace? If you had never had any, any conflict, that's, that's why this whole thing about, uh, you know, well, you have to have, we have to move toward herd immunity, okay? Yeah. What? Yeah. That, that's why, now, understand, as a parent, my job is to protect my child, train them, raise them up, do what I can. But to protect a child does not mean to make them naive or not know what's out there. That's the best way to get them captured by that once they get old enough and they're away from you. So you have to be able to show them darkness and light. And you're light and this is how you live. But if you just hide the darkness from them, at some point they're going to get seduced by it or get tricked into it or something. Right? People say, well, you're, for instance, with all the, uh, you know, I don't know if you know, but Dallas is one of the top uh, sex trafficking uh, communities cities in the United States. Yeah. Okay, but if, and people say, well, but you're putting fear. If you teach your daughter to watch for this or look for that, you're teaching fear. No, 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 that's wisdom. Right. It is wisdom, it's not fear, right? To teach someone to watch for this or look for that or to recognize this and to stay away from that. Or when you see something like that, tell somebody, right? And because if you tell them it's fear, then they're going to say, well, they're in fear, and so I don't want to look like I'm in fear, so I won't say anything. Mm. Now, see, the devil loves for people to not communicate. Yeah, right. and, and that's like even in church. Well, you know, 
I knew this was going on, but I didn't want to say anything because, you know, I don't want to cause division. No, no, no. Darkness has to be exposed. Amen. Amen? And the way the enemy works is he tries to keep things from being exposed, and he tries to keep the darkness there, and then he's lied to Christians. And said, well, I don't want to get into gossip. I don't. Well, don't gossip. Don't, don't talk amongst yourself about it, about that person. Go to a leader. Let them know something and so they can deal with it. If you can't see, it's only gossip when you have no authority in that area to deal with it yourself. But you have the ability to take it to a person that has the authority to deal with it. And when you're talking to that person, it's not gossip. You understand? This is how things are dealt with. And the enemy loves for us not to deal with things. Because if you're not going to deal with it, it'll just stay hidden. And then it never, it never comes out and it can't get fixed. You know, if you don't know what the problem is, you can't really fix it. So all of this goes back. So that's what I'm saying. Yes. Is there power in Christ? Absolutely. Is there power in being a new creation? Absolutely. But it's not just about power. There has to be the union with God and the union with God is not about power. The union with God is about his nature, his character, everything about him that you can walk with him. That's why righteousness, they say, is the ability to stand before God without any fear of condemnation or guilt or inferiority. Think about that. You're standing before God without a sense of inferiority. That's phenomenal, right? Now, that doesn't mean you stand there as an equal to God going, oh, yeah, well, if I don't like what you say, I'm not going to do it, and you can't do anything about it. No, that's, that's stupid. Right? If you do that, don't stand near me because you know, I, don't, I don't want nothing to hit you. I don't want something to hit me if it was meant for you. You know, so, amen. But the idea is that you, you have oneness with God. See, there, there's this aspect of respect, and people don't get that. Many people think that if you show respect, you're actually, as we used to say kowtowing to them, you know what I mean? That you're, you're, you're bowing before them if you respect people. No, the problem in the world right now is that people don't have respect. Because respect is one aspect of love. If you don't respect someone, you don't love them. You know one of the fastest ways to tell if somebody respects you? When you're talking, do they interrupt you? When you're talking, now I'm not talking about if you're hogging the conversation and going on and on and on. That, there's some, there, you know, there has to be some way of stopping. I don't know, put your hand up and go, you know, I, I don't know. But there has to be something, right? But I'm talking about if every time you start to talk, they start talking, that's a, that's a, a blatant sign of disrespect. They don't respect you, right? And if they don't respect you, they don't love you. It's just that simple. So what does that tell us? Well, you can't work on them. You can only work on you. Right. So you have to watch what you're doing. Yeah. Right? And you have to make sure. Now, again, there's ways to interrupt without cutting somebody off. Right? But, again, this goes, and it's, it's, it's sad because this stuff was taught in school, you know, a couple of decades ago. Right. Okay? A, couple, a couple of score of years ago. <laughs> okay? <laughs> But now there, there is none of that. And so we're seeing the erosion of a civilization. But it's because mostly because people don't respect each other anymore and they don't show respect. Now, again, I, I got to finish this up. We're just about done. He says here, uh, verse 8, For if these things be in you and abound, not just in you, but they abound, they make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You hear that? You will never be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of Jesus Christ if you have these things, virtue, knowledge, faith, temperance, all the godliness, all these things, charity, all that. If you have these things in your life and they abound, you will never be barren or unfruitful. Can you imagine what that would be like? Whatever you put your hand to works. I mean, you think about all these things that are going on and you, it would be a whole different way of living because you would live, as the Bible says, circumspectly. You would live separate. You're in the world, but not of the world. And then people go, how does that work? Yeah. You know, I mean, the only way I know to get ahead is, you know, crawl over somebody else or put them down and me 
do something. No, no. That, that you can do that in the world, but it only lasts a while. And then they're sowing and reaping and somebody crawls over you. But in Christ, you can defer one to another. And it's amazing. When you defer, you show honor. And when you show honor, you're showing respect. And whenever you give honor, you're given honor. It's the way it works. We may not like it, but it's the way it works. It's, it's the system God put into effect that is always working. You can't get past it. That's one of the things. Nobody gets away with anything. You know, it's funny because we got people saying no justice, no peace. Okay, I, I, I agree things have to be done, but there are legal systems in which to do them. And if that legal system isn't working, then there has to be a way of going, uh, you know, about it to make it happen. Uh -huh. At the same time, to say no justice, no. Honestly, what most of them mean is not justice. What they mean is no satisfaction. Because mm -hmm. what they want is satisfaction, not really justice. So we have to realize that the idea of justice, God is in charge of that, not man. Justice may not happen on your time schedule, but it will happen. Why? Because God, the, heaven, the God, the judge of heaven and earth is just, and he will do what is right. And it will all, and nothing's hidden that won't come out. And, and nothing's done that won't be, honestly, fixed. Amen? Amen? So our, our job is to be the people that God can work through. But to do that, we have to have the, the, the virtue. We have to have these elements in us. So that's what happened with Samson. You look at Samson and you look at uh, Joseph. Joseph had these things and he never fell. Samson didn't have them. Had great strength, but look what happened. He didn't have the character to carry the strength. He didn't have the character to carry the gift, the anointing, as we would say many times, that God gave him. So our job is to develop the character, because that's what he said. Purge yourself, add these things, do diligence. You put these things in you, guess what? God will make sure you got the gift. You make sure you got the character, he makes sure you got the gift. Why? Because he can't, he won't put more... See, what is it? God will not allow more to come on you than you're able to bear. When do we use that? In problems. Isn't that right? When things are going down the tubes, that's what we do. Don't worry. God knows you can handle this. He's not going to let anything on you more than you can handle. Isn't that right? Do you realize he, he also doesn't allow any more power than you can handle? Why? Because it would destroy you like it did Samson. Now, there are instances, and we can see cases of this, where people don't have the character. We can see it in the church. People don't have character, but they have a gift. But they never end well. At some point, they fall. At some point, something happens to them, and it doesn't end well. But you look at the people that had character. They end well. Mm -hmm. Dr. Sumrall, Billy Graham, right? Those are some that ended well. I'm not going to list the ones that didn't. You know them. You know the names. I mean, I'm not, gonna, I'm not here to bash anybody. And some people fall and get back up. And all we remember is their fall. Right. Even though they might have had 20, 30 years of back up. Right. Amen? Yep. So that's why I don't name those kind of things. Why? Because you don't know where they are with God. Right. And, it, you know, if God doesn't remember their past, I'm not going to remember it. Amen? Because only the devil does, and I don't want to work with him. Right? So, so he says, so if you do these things, and if they, if they are in you and they abound, you'll ne neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacks these things, look at this, is blind. So if you lack these things that he told you to add, you're blind and cannot see afar off and has forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. What does that mean? You're, always, you're still living under guilt. You're still living under condemnation. You're still living like your past is your present. See, that's where most Christians live. Yeah. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, giving dil give diligence, there it is again, to make your calling and election sure. So it, maybe your calling and election isn't sure. Because he says, do this to make sure, right? For if you do these things, you shall never fall. 
And that's a good promise of the nature of God that you can bring into your life. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Now, very quickly, we're just going to go through some more scripture. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 33 says, Who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, and look at that next one, obtained promises. So how do you obtain these exceeding great and precious promises? Through faith. Amen? That means you start acting like it's true before you actually see it in your life. They stop the mouths of lions. There's Daniel. Quench the violence of fire. There's the Hebrew children in the fiery furnace. Escape the edge of the sword. Out of weakness, through faith, were made strong. Wax valiant in fight. Turn to flight the armies of the aliens. Talking, it's not talking about aliens. <laughs> <laughs> I have people, see, right there in the Bible. <laughs> UFOs and aliens, I'm, I'm telling you, they're right there. How do you think the aliens got here? It's UFOs. It's right there in the Bible. No, no, no. He's talking about foreigners invading Israel. All right? Let's get that clear. Okay. Women receive their dead raised to life again. Isn't it amazing? They point out women receive their dead raised to life. Remember the Shunammite woman. Right? And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned. That is not the Colorado style. <laughs> they were stoned. Okay. That's with rocks. Okay. It's funny now I even have to mention that part. Okay. It's amazing. You can actually see the generation that raises their head when I say that. They were stoned. <laughs> what was he saying? I wasn't listening. What was he saying? <laughs> yeah, I got your attention, did All right, so. <laughs> they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with a sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented. Now watch. Hebrews 8, 6 says this. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. You hear that? These promises that you become a partaker of God's divine nature. These are what our covenant is based on. We have better. If you go back and read the blessings of the old covenant, it was phenomenal. And he says we have better promises. It's a, that, that in itself is amazing. Now, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 says this. For all the promises of God, in him are yea, yes, and in him, amen, which means so be it. So all the promises in him are yes and so be it. Right? Now notice, unto the glory of God by us. So by us taking these promises, putting them in our life, activating them in our life, they are yes and amen. So there's no promise in here that God won't back up in us if we choose to believe it and act on it, he, he can't say no, right? Under the glory of God by us. So when we take these promises and make them part of our life and do them, it brings glory to God. It's not selfish. It's not, you know, all these other things that people try to say, you know, name it and claim it and blab it and grab it and all that kind of stuff, right? <laughs> no. He's saying when you take a promise of mine, when you take it out of that word, out of the Bible, and you put it into your life and you live it like it's true, that brings glory to him and it brings it to pass in your life. Amen. Because your faith activates it. Yes. Amen? Yes. Now, <clears throat> 2 Corinthians 6, 16, it says, In what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, now listen carefully to these words, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Notice, he goes on. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and you shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? But now, notice, in verse 7, having therefore these promises, those are promises. Having these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves 
from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, your spirit, when it's recreated, is recreated perfect and complete. At the same time, most people's Christian lives start and then go up, but they don't always go up. And sometimes they go up, back down a little bit, and then they back up, and they go back. You know, it looks like a stock market graph, right? Why? That's whenever they get sidetracked, whenever they start getting distracted. It's when all this, because all the stuff we're seeing, think about this. Jesus said, all these things the enemy tries to use is distractions. And honestly, that's what we're seeing in the world right now is a lot of distraction. And people are glued to their televisions. They're glued to the news. Why? And it's a distraction to keep them from what's important, which is the word of God. But he said, having these promises, what promises? I'll walk in them. I'll dwell in them. I'll walk in them. I'll talk in them. They'll be my sons and daughters, and I'll be their God. Isn't that right? He says, if you touch not the unclean thing, if you come out from among them, separate yourselves and do this, then he says, then when you do that, then I will walk in you, and I'll be your, you'll be my sons and daughters. So he's, these are promises to us. You want him to walk in you, dwell in you, to, to talk in you? You want to be his son, his daughter, and you want him to be your God? Then you have to cleanse yourself of these things because your spirit can get contaminated to the degree. Now notice he says you can cleanse yourself of all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. So in any area, you can be cleansed before God, but you do it yourself. He didn't say he will do it for you. Now, yeah. part of that is taking it to him and going, I don't, want, I don't want this, so help me, and his power is there to help you. But at the same time, you have to cleanse yourself. Amen? Amen. See, people don't like this, but there, there is a responsibility on, on your part. Yeah. So then he says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Galatians 3.16. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He saith not, and to seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is in Christ. And now we know if you go and read the rest of Galatians 3 and Galatians 4, we find out that we are in Christ, and therefore we are of the seed that the promises were made to. The promises were not made to Abraham and to the children of Israel. They were made to Christ, and they were made through Abraham. Do you get that? The promises were made to one, the seed, which is Christ. And we are in him. Therefore, the promises are yes and amen to us. See, that's why God can't say no. Second reason. Number one, he can't say no to what he's already said yes to because he can't change what's come out of his mouth. He also can't say no to Jesus. Isn't that right? Why? Because Jesus kept the covenant. He kept it perfectly. He kept the law perfectly. He never violated it. What does that mean? That means because of that, there's no curse in Christ. Right? Why? Because there only needs to be a curse if you transgress the covenant. But in Christ, he didn't transgress. So in him, there's no curse. We are in him. Our reliance is upon him, and therefore all the blessings are there. Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 through 14. The blessings are in Christ. No cursings in Christ. Why? Because he didn't mess up. Amen? And because we're in him, we partake of his covenant, and now we are one with him, so whatever he got, we are joint heirs with Christ, and whatever he has, we have. Amen? Amen? Yes. So there's no curses for you if you're in Christ. Right. Amen? Right. I don't know if you know how good this is. That means it's only the promises. What are the promises? The promises are all the blessings. But they're promises until you live them out. When you live them out, they're blessings. But until you take a promise and live it out, it's still just a promise, not a blessing. Amen? Yeah. All right. I'm, I'm just about finished. I promise. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work. In other words, what he's saying is God is not unrighteous in that he would forget your work. Right? And labor of love which you have showed toward his name, in that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience 
inherit the promises. So what does that mean? If, you, if you're not following them through faith and patience, in other words, if you don't see their faith and patience and operate that way, then you're slothful. But he says, don't be slothful, but through diligence, follow those. Imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, surely, blessing, I will bless you, and multiplying, I will multiply you. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Patiently endured. So what does that mean? God cannot say no to what he's already said yes to. Now, remember this. Believing or faith, okay, pretty much the same thing, activates what you believe, okay? Believing can make you immune to sickness, and it can make you impervious to attack. Do you get that? If the enemy attacks you, he should not be able to touch you. He should only be able to fire his fiery darts into your shield of faith. It should never touch you. 1 John 5, 18. We know, we know, we don't think, we don't guess. We know that whosoever is born of God sinneth not, but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one touches him not. You notice that? You keep yourself and the wicked one doesn't touch you. How do you keep yourself? You keep yourself in the love of God, but you keep yourself in that it says that you don't live in sin. Because that's what he's saying. We know that whoever is born of God does not live in sin. It doesn't mean he doesn't make a mistake. Because he says later in 1 John that if you sin, you can confess it. So we know that mistakes can be made. Amen? <clears throat> but he said, you don't live this life. And we know that we are of God, and the whole world lies in wickedness. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us an understanding. What has he given us? An understanding. That we may know him that is true, and we are in him that is true, even in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Isn't that simple? Yeah. <clears throat> so, it's by these promises that everything has worked out in our life. We've been given these promises, and all the promises are yes, and so be it. So, for not living in one of the promises, <clears throat> it's not God's fault, it's ours. Amen? Amen? And it is, now, maybe you're not, but you don't have to stay there. You can turn around with a decision. So I would say don't go any further without making a promise into a reality of the blessing it was meant to be. Amen? Amen. Did y'all get anything out of this this morning? Yeah. <coughs> Amen. Amen. Well, those of you that... Um, you know, if, if you've not made Jesus Lord, you need to do so. And it's not an emotional thing. It's not like, well, I just don't feel like, you know, like I need to. I don't, I don't feel excitement. I'm not. No, we're not going to pull on you that way. This is not an emotional decision. This is, should be a logical, clear decision of you know what you should do and you need to do it. Because to him that knows to do good and do it that not, to him it's sin. And so... It's not a, an emotion. We're not going to get up here and you know, play music and keep pulling on you. Amen? Why? Because that's what happens you know, <clears throat> when you go out and get drunk and wake up the next morning enlisted in the Marines. <laughs> you, you did it on an emotion, and, and the, the emotion <laughs> doesn't always last through the enlistment. Yeah. Right? And so... You need this needs because this could be a decision toward martyrdom. This could be. It could be, right. but it, you need to make that decision of how serious you are beforehand. Jesus said, "Count the cost." He didn't say, "Come no matter what, don't care, don't worry about it. We'll work it out. Just just sign up. We'll work it out." No, that's what recruiters say, yeah. right? Jesus didn't. He said, "Listen, you may not be able to handle this. You need to count the cost. You got to make sure that if you have ten thousand. You can beat that army with 20,000. 
or you make peace before they get to you. In other words, he said, count the cost. Make sure you're making a decision, not based on emotion, but on a steadfast faith that you know what you're doing. And so if you've not made Jesus Lord, you need to do it. Those of you that are here, but also anyone watching by internet, you need to give your life. And I'm not just saying, well, Jesus, I take you as my Savior. Now, he's Savior. Now, you may not be saved, but he's Savior whether you are saved or not. You need to make him Lord of your life, right? Because he's Lord. Whether he's your Lord or not, he's still Lord. But you got to make him Lord of your life. And so that's you receiving that. And with that comes all the precious promises. Everything you need, all life, godliness, everything, it's given to you once you make him Lord. It is accessible in a promise, and you can live it out. Amen? Amen. Also, you need to experience and walk in the fullness of the Holy Spirit, receiving what most people call the baptism of the Spirit, which normally is accompanied with speaking in other tongues. And you say, I don't understand that. Nobody does. <laughs> don't worry about it. You're in, a good, you're in good company. Nobody understands it. Uh, but it is what it is, and it's a gift. And he said, if you're born again, you can ask for this gift, and he will give it to you. Isn't that amazing? Right. And, that, and that gift, see, salvation is the greatest gift God ever gave to the world. The baptism of the Holy Spirit is the greatest gift God ever gave to the church. And so we need it. If we didn't need it, he wouldn't give it. Amen? So uh, if you need, and then, of course, also physical healing, mental healing, hurts, all these things, he is the balm of Gilead. He can fix you spirit, soul, and body, and he can do it in a moment. He didn't have to do it through 10 years of you know, counseling and writing checks. He can do it in an instant. Amen? Amen. And so uh, I'm fixing to put my stuff up, and I'll come back out. But if you need to leave, oh, we want to watch the video. Oh, yeah, we'll play that. Yeah, we're going to watch this video. Uh, Y'all know we work a lot in South Africa. And our South African director, Erica, uh, wrote George the other day and said, hey, can we buy some canopies, some tent things, uh, because the kids and everybody are having to sit out in the sun and it was hot, and it was now it's cold down there right now. But uh, they they needed shelter, and so they said, "Can we buy this?" And they were like 1,500 rand, which is very cheap. And so, because it's about 12 or 15 rand per dollar, so it's pretty cheap. And so she uh, said, "Can we buy those uh, for these kids?" And we're like, "Sure, of course, yeah." Um, she didn't have to ask permission, but she always does, you know, because she's good, <laughs> and she's she she does things right. And so they sent us this video uh, today of the canopies, wanted us to see it. And I want to show you the, we can show you the pictures, but I want to show you especially the video. So let's go ahead and play that video. That's about it. Yep. Amen? Amen. Amen. You notice that's the next generation coming up in South Africa. Amen? And we hope to see the same thing right here in America. Have you know America has become as big a mission field, if not bigger, than most other countries? Amen? So, anyway, I'll get started again if I don't shut up. So, but if you need to leave, God bless you. We appreciate you coming. If we can be of assistance, be sure to contact us. But if you need any type of uh, ministry, then uh, my team will put that together and we will come back out and minister to you. Other than that, God bless. See you next Sunday. Hey guys. Hey, I just wanted to welcome you. I'm Curry Blake, uh, General Overseer of John G. Lake Ministries. We are so glad that you have decided to take the step to investigate life teams, becoming a certified divine healing technician, getting plugged in and taking the responsibility to enter into the life that Jesus has actually died to give us. So the next step now, since you've come this far, is to simply sign up. That's how to get started, just sign up. And when you do, now you're gonna go and check your email box and you're gonna get instructions on how to become certified DHT, how to start a life team. Uh, but you know, and, and maybe some of you are already within JGLM and you're already a leader at some level 
and you're saying, okay, why do I have to do this? Well, it's very simple. We're putting everybody into the same system so that it works like a well-oiled machine, like we've talked about, because we want to make sure everything is working very well together. So uh, if you are an existing leader within JGLM, we can tell you nothing's gonna change. We're just gathering the information so it's all in one database and we are gonna be able to communicate with you a lot better. This is, this is going to really solve the communication problems that uh, we've, we've had over the past. But this is a new day and you get to get right into it. So sign up, do it now, don't wait, do it now, and then check your email box. It's just that simple. So listen, I really appreciate this. Jesus appreciates this because you're plugging in and you're wanting to take responsibility. So I look forward to working with you. We're gonna have a great time advancing the kingdom. God bless you. We would like to thank our partners and friends for making today's broadcast possible. If you enjoyed today's message or would like more information and resources, please visit our website at jglm.org. Rise up and heal the earth. Rise up and be the light. Rise up and fight the fight. Come on and rise. We've got to rise. If you are considering partnering with us and would like to support our mission, please visit jglm.org forward slash partners. Proceeds will go toward the cost of the television broadcast and our mission work around the world. Visit jglmmedia.com to watch this program and more at any time. Subscribe for full access to our entire library, or you can rent, buy, and watch for free select resources. With over 700 hours of teaching to watch and more being added, we've got your needs covered. Satan's head, it's time to rise up.